Hi, Pastor Matt Morton here, lead pastor of Cross Fellowship Church. Uh, before the message begins, I just want to take a moment and say thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, it is our hope and our prayer that by watching this video we uh, and hearing the message that indeed it can help you take one step closer to Jesus today. At the end of the sermon today, you'll hear me offer an invitation to the audience. And the invitation is simply to put your trust and your faith and your hope in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If you're listening today or watching online and you have never done that, uh, can I just encourage you to take that step, take the step to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Now maybe you have some questions or you just need to know more about that or even how to do that. At the bottom of the screen here is a telephone number. That's the church office, uh, please give that number a call. And if it's during office hours, the, the staff will direct you towards a pastor to help walk you through uh, how do you put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ. And if it's out of office hours, please leave a message and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, again, thank you so much for watching today and blessings. Be faithful. Did you guys all see the sign coming in? Yeah. Did you guys see the sign? No? Really? Okay, on your way out today, exit the foyer, right? And look up between the TVs. You can't miss it. I promise. It's a 12 foot by 6 foot sign that looks, be faithful. All right. Um, we're going to talk more about Be Faithful here in a little bit, but let me introduce the text and the topic this morning. This has probably all happened to us. Our phone rings, we look down, and it's the unknown number. And now we find ourselves in a big conundrum. Do we accept the call, or do we decline the call? Decline. decline. Everyone's declining. Just by a show of hands, who declines unknown numbers? Wow. I'm not going to ask about you acceptees out there, but I'm one of you. All right, so... Do we accept the call? Do we decline the call? Now, now, either decision has some implications with it, right? Because if we accept the call, if we accept the call, it could be someone calling to ask us about our car warranty, right? <laughs> and then we need to navigate that conversation in kindness, in love, because these are folks who are just doing their job and they have a script. But we have to navigate that conversation on how do we say no 17 different ways, right? But we got to be kind. So, so look, be kind. You know, they're just doing their job as well. So, so man, if you accept it, it could be spam, right? But if you decline it, you know, you can decline it, and then all of a sudden, you get that little notification, voicemail. Oh. So you got to then dial in your voicemail, and you listen. Oh, it was a friend that was calling you, and so you called them back. And then you got to navigate that awkward conversation. Like, hey, sorry I didn't take your call you're not in my contacts. I'm not in your contacts. Like, they haven't raised to that status in your life to actually be entered as a contact in your phone. And you got to try to navigate that. And man, it just would have been so much easier if I just would have accepted that call. Well, I kind of tell that story because in our text this morning, we see the call of the disciples. Right? And they also had a decision. Do they accept the call or do they decline the call? Now, spoiler alert, they accepted it. All right? They accepted the call, and, and we will look this morning at their calling. And if we look closely, we can see that as Jesus called them, he gave them several instructions. Several instructions that, that are really good principles and instructions for us and the calling that God has for us. And so before we dive too closely into the scripture, I want us to all get on the same page about this idea of 
calling. It can sometimes be a Christianese word, and, and it can mean different things. And so let's just get on the same page. Let me define it for you, right? That calling, in regards to a, a Christian calling, calling is a profound impression, understanding, or even a word from the Lord for us to obey or calling us to action. I'll say that again. A calling is a profound impression impression, an understanding, or even a a word from the Lord, from the Lord to us, calling us to action, to obey. Now, you guys know I love visual aids, and you know I like to draw. And so I have driven, or driven, I've drawn um, four circles up here. Now, these four circles um, are to lay out what I believe, what I see to be the four different types of calling. Right? Four different types of calling. That In this outer circle here, we have this call to salvation that everyone receives this call to salvation. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A rabbi's yoke Uh, was his teaching. So Jesus is saying, hey, uh, look, if you're uh, all who are heavy laden, come take my teaching upon you, which is simply this. Come to me, put your faith in me, and you will find rest. Of course, John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John 7.37, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. And drink, and then one of my favorite verses, 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in, uh, to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. This is a call to salvation, to put your, your, your faith, your trust, your hope in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And some people accept this call, and some people decline it. Some people accept this call and some people decline it. But for those who accept it, right, we call them Christians, our brothers and sisters, adopted sons and daughters of the king, they enter that circle and then there's another calling on their life. And that additional call to the Christian is a call to serve the body. The very first sermon I ever preached here as lead pastor came out of John 13 34, a new command I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, the world will know that you're my disciples. We are to love and serve one another. Galatians 6.10, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially those who are in the household of faith. And then 1 Corinthians 12.7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit, a spiritual gift for the common good. You've been gifted by the Holy Spirit to glorify God and edify the body. And so, sadly, some reject the call of salvation, but those who accept, they receive the second call, and sadly, some people reject or decline the call to serve the body. Talk about that in a little bit. And then there's another call, right? A call to serve the world. This is exactly what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 5, that we should be salt and that we should be light to the world. That in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We're to serve the world. Matthew 5, 44, that we are to, we are to pray. You know, we're to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. We're, we're, to, we're to serve them, the world that can be against us. And then Hebrews 13, 16, do not neglect to do good and share what you have. And then even, uh, and some people, uh, some Christians decline that call. And then we have the last circle of calling here. Not everyone receives this calling. This is a call to ministry leadership. And it's a heavy, it's a weighty call. And it it comes with several implications. In fact, John, James 3.1 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with a greater strictness. 1 Peter 5.2 lays out how we are to lead in ministry. Right? Not 
Uh, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And then uh, Ephesians 4.11 lays out spiritual gifts specifically for ministry leadership. And he gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the shepherds and the teachers. Now, there's a reason I use circles to depict calling. Because in my 18, 19 years of ministry, there has been one question that I have been asked more than any other question. One question that I've been asked more than any other question. And it falls in the category of how do I know what God's call on my life is? How do I know what the will of God is for me? That, that question I've gotten asked more than any other question question, and I have watched human being after human being be paralyzed in their Christian walk because they're trying to find that exact dot. They're trying to find the exact, what is the will of God? I don't know. I don't want to mess this up. I'm going to mess it up. I don't. uh, And so they're paralyzed, uh, and and they they have inaction because they just don't know exactly what they're supposed to be doing. And my friends, I would tell you this, right? Get into the circle, Right? Because in the circle, as you start to serve, you will get assignments. Things will clear up for you. You will get clarity as you start to serve. You know, God doesn't really steer a parked car. So you're called to serve the body. You're called to serve the world. And, and your assignment becomes clearer and clearer and clearer. And, and, and it did for me. But I will tell you, for many, many years, I misunderstood my calling, and it paralyzed me. It paralyzed me. I, I was called to be, well, I thought, I was called to be a youth pastor, right? I was called to be a youth pastor over a dodgeball game in 1987-ish, right? It's a fun story. I'll tell you about it later, right? So during dodgeball, I'm called to be a youth pastor. So I grow up, and I was like in third grade, right? I grow up, I'm going to be a youth pastor, 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 right? And then, you know, I ended up joining the military, and all sorts of things happened, namely 9-11 and a bunch of other things. So I ended up staying in the, uh, in the military, and I tried to serve um, kind of, but not really, because I was called to be a youth pastor. And while some of my soldiers acted like children, they really weren't. So I couldn't really be a youth pastor to them. And so for seven years, right, I moved six times, all these different bases and locations. And I'm like, once I get planted, then I'm going to be a youth pastor. And so I got planted here in Colorado Springs. And, and I said, hey, I believe I'm called to be a youth pastor. And so Pastor Bob started me off by filling up the pop machine. <laughs> okay. And then I moved into life group, and then I was the associate youth pastor, and then I was the interim youth pastor, and I was bivocational, and then I was the associate youth pastor again. I'm like, this is it. I'm living my dream. And then one day, Pastor Bob calls me into his office and says, hey, I, I think you need to move over to be the college pastor. What? I'm the youth pastor. I'm not a college pastor. I'm a youth pastor. Is God changing my call? Because I, I felt this pull, right? I felt this pull to, yeah, I think I should go over to college, but what does that, what does that mean? Am I, did I miss here, God, oh no, like it was a little bit of a crisis to me. And thankfully, I came to this understanding right about that time that I wasn't called necessarily to be a youth pastor. I was called to ministry leadership, right? And specifically, I was called to preach and teach the gospel. And my first assignment was the soldiers and airmen that I worked with, and I declined it because I didn't understand my calling. And then my next assignment was here, and it was the youth, and then it was college, and now it's lead pastor. I am called to preach and teach the gospel, and my current assignment is Cross Fellowship Church lead pastor, and I hope it doesn't change, right? But but we need to understand that, that there's assignments, and God can move us in our assignments, but we need to jump into that circle. We need to start moving and, and serving the way that God has called us. Now, A call to serve the body, the world, and a call to ministry leadership is all a call to ministry, right? You, my friends, if you are a Christian, you are called to ministry. Did you know that? Yeah, okay, so I'm going to make sure that you know that. I want you to look at your neighbor, and I want you to say, you are called to ministry. Great job. Caleb Tanksley, turn to your father and say, you are called to ministry. Okay, now, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, I am called to ministry. 
All right. All right. Listen, this is a truth, and I want you to hang on to it. And this is why I say it's a truth. Let's go back to Ephesians. I already said that that first verse, 11, like these are the spiritual gifts, right? These are the gifts of the Holy Spirit are, that are given to uh, those who are called to ministry leadership. And then verse 12, why are they given? To equip the saints, that's anyone who's accepted the call of salvation, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. To do the work of the ministry means that you are a minister. You are called to ministry. And you have to decide, are you going to accept it or are you going to decline it? And my hope, my prayer for you is that you accept it. And if you're going to accept this call to ministry, we need to look at the text this morning and understand that there are some instructions to that calling. So with that, let's go ahead and dig in. Matthew chapter 10, we're going to just start with verse 1. It's on page 50. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are. Now, I hope you, you caught this real quick because this is really fascinating, right? He called his, oh, let's turn the pen on, forgive me. All right. um, he, he called his 12 disciples, and then in a course of one verse, they became apostles. From disciples to apostles in just one verse. Well, what's the difference between a disciple and an apostle? Well, first off, disciples are students. Right? In this context, they are students of a rabbi. They're learning his yoke, his teaching, how to be like him. And then apostles, these are qualified representatives sent on a mission from that rabbi. But qualified representatives, they can speak on behalf of the rabbi. Well, what makes them qualified? Well, simply this. Jesus gave them authority. And that's our very first instruction we need to grab onto. That we need to remember who calls, who qualifies, and who empowers us. Right? Jesus calls you. Jesus and his authority qualifies you, and Jesus empowers you. God will never call you to something he doesn't empower you for. I mean, did you see that list of, of, of what they were supposed to do? Heal every disease, every affliction, cast out demons? You could... You need, some, you need Jesus' authority to do that. So remember who calls you. And I will tell you, ministry can get difficult. And there are times where you're, you're trying to minister and things aren't going right and you just start questioning, am I doing even the right thing? Did God even call me to this? Look, that, those are the days where, where you need to just lean on what God has called you to do and be faithful what he has called you to do. Be faithful to that which he has called you to to do because sometimes our calling is all that we have. Now, let's look at these 12 apostles. First thing I want you to notice is they were in pairs, right? They're listed in pairs. They were sent out in pairs. Simon, who is called Peter, right? Simon, of course, denied Jesus. And uh, Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. The sons of thunder. What a great nickname, right? The sons of thunder. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas, the doubter. And Matthew, who was the lowest of the low societally as a tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. Now, Luke records James, the son of Alphaeus, um, his name as Judas, the son of James. And my guess is, by the time Matthew's writing this gospel, James, the son of Alphaeus, just uh, shows up and says, Hey, um, Matthew, look, I've been having conversations with people, and I say, Yeah, I was a disciple of Jesus, and Oh, yeah, what's your name? Well, I'm Judas. You're Judas? Well, not that Judas, right? So can we just go by my middle name, Matthew? Can you just list me as, you know, so I think that's just why we see James, the son of Alphaeus, and then Thaddeus, by the way. We don't know much about Thaddeus, kind of a, kind of a no name. Um, I'm, I know that we'll get to find out about him, but uh, no significant history that we know of. And then Simon the Zealot. A zealot is a political activist resorting often to, to really just, you know, violence to get their way. And then Judas Iscariot, who, of course betrayed him. So there's two instructions that we can pull out just out of these lists of names. The first instruction is simply this. In your call to ministry, take someone with you. Now, sometimes that means very practically, like, hey, I'm going to visit, you know, someone in the hospital. Sometimes I'm going to go work, you know, go help this person out in their house. And so sometimes it's very practical. But then, but then also there's just a very sacred spiritual piece of this of take someone alongside you in your journey to hold you accountable to your ministry. 
When I meet with uh, my guys who I do accountability with, one of the questions that's listed is, have you fulfilled the mandates of your calling? Like, I'm being held to, you know, I'm having some accountability. Like, am I doing, am I being faithful to do that which I have been called? Take someone with you. Now, the second thing that I, I want us to look at is we, we see this motley crew of individuals. Right? We see this motley crew of individuals. Do not let your past forsake your call. Can't tell you how many times I've heard those words. Man, I really messed up this time. God can't use me. Completely forfeited everything on that one. Messed this one up. I want everyone to do me just a quick favor. Take a big deep breath in and let it out. Okay, guess what? That is confirmation that God has something for you. Right? Every breath you take is not yours. It's been given to you, and it's been given to you for a purpose because God has something for you. You've been called to minister. And if you're breathing, then you should be ministering. Don't let your past forsake your call. All right, verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, this is a pretty familiar uh, saying. Uh, Jewish people would understand this. In fact, Jesus, in Matthew 15, 24, he said, I, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That phrase, lost sheep of the house of Israel, this would resonate with certainly Matthew's readers, but then also those who, who heard it, because that phrase is used time and time again in the Old Testament. One place that it's used is in Jeremiah. As God is speaking through his prophet, he says, my people, my chosen people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. God refers to his chosen people as lost sheep and, and really gets onto the shepherds who led them astray. In fact, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel, again, speaking through the prophet, God really speaks against these, these, these shepherds who led his chosen people astray. Ezekiel 34, about the first 10 verses of Ezekiel, God really speaks against these shepherds who led these people astray. And then in verse 15 of Ezekiel 34, we see something just awesome. This is God speaking through his prophet. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak and the fat and the strong. I will destroy and I will feed them in justice. God, through his prophet, it's prophesied that God will be the shepherd of the lost sheep of Israel. And so that's why when Jesus makes this statement, it is huge. Because Jesus is saying, is claiming deity right then. Hey, you know that prophecy all the way in Ezekiel that you heard about? That God's going to be the shepherd? Well, guess what? I'm God. I'm the good shepherd, and I'm here. And so Jesus sends out the 12, saying, hey, go only to the Jewish people. Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, because I am the good shepherd, and that's who I've been called to come shepherd and minister to, because that's, I, I, I keep my word. And all the way back in Ezekiel, I gave my word that I would be the shepherd. But what we see and what we'll start with next week is really in Matthew chapters 10 through 28, through the end of the book, we see a, re a rejection of, God, uh, of these lost sheep of the house of Israel. We see a rejection of the good shepherd. Right? We see a rejection of the Jewish people uh, of the good shepherd. And so the invite, if you will, the invite opens up. In the last week of his life, Jesus tells two parables, one about the wedding feast and one about the vineyard. And in both of those parables, the point is very clear, that God's chosen people have rejected the Messiah, have rejected Jesus, and now the invite for all to enter the kingdom of heaven is now extended. And so we see Jesus' last words here in Matthew 28. Again, there's that word authority. But go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, not just the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but all nations. And so put yourself in the sandals of the disciples. They're, they're told, hey, just go to this Jewish place. Just, just go to this town, this town, this town. Not that town. 
yeah, but Jesus, I thought good news was, for, I mean, this is good news for everyone, right? Uh, I don't know. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. These are the parameters that he's given me. Well, yeah, that had to happen. That rejection had to happen for the invitation to be extended. And so what's the instruction for you and I? Simply this, that your calling has parameters to fit into God's bigger plan. And so maybe you don't understand why you're called to this area of ministry. That's okay. Be faithful and obey. You might not see the whole big picture. I question this in my life over and over and over again. Like, why am I still in the military? Why am I still in the military? I'm supposed to be a youth pastor. You know, there was, I'm so grateful for my military time and the fact that I got to do this pastor at Bible Cachely and God. I, I just see it, right? And, and I still don't see the whole big plan. I know there's more. But your calling has parameters to fit into God's plan. All right, verse 7. And proclaim as you go. I love that. Which really goes back to assignment, right? And proclaim as you go, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without pain, give without pay. Now, we already talked about assignments, right? Your assignments can change, your calling doesn't. And, but as you go, you proclaim. As you go, you proclaim. And then the list of tasks, heal the sick, raise the dead. I've never done that. Cleanse lepers, cast out demons. This takes some supernatural gifting. Right? This takes some supernatural gifting. So there's two instructions for us in this right here. First off, right, your calling has assignments as you go. And then secondly, use your God-given gifts for your calling. Use your God-given gifts for your calling. I cannot, it is, it, I was going to use the word frustrating, but really it's heartbreaking to see, you know, so many people or, or to encounter people who, who God's just all over them and has gifted them and they refuse to operate in their gifting. Right? They decline that. That's heartbreaking. It really is. Now, Jesus said, you received without pain, so give without pay. What does that mean? Well, you've received this spiritual gift. I already talked about that in 1 Corinthians 12, 7. You've received this spiritual gift as a gift. You didn't have to pay, so operate in it and give freely, whether it's wisdom, you know, pour out wisdom, speak with whatever, if it's teaching, whatever it is, you've been gifted freely, operate in that gifting and, and leave it all on the table. You received without pain, give without pay. All right, just a few more here. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. Jesus is telling his disciples, these apostles, that this missionary journey, this is going to require faith. And, and Jesus, you know, he's clear. He's like, hey, don't hoard up a bunch of stuff for you. Like, get moving. Obey. All right? I'm calling you obey because delayed obedience is what? I love you guys. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Go. And it's going to require faith. Now, I love this last statement here. For the laborer deserves his food. That, that, is, that is just a, a, an indicator. Hey, apostle, listen, if you're being called, right, you're going to go in my authority. I'm going to empower you. And not only that, if you're doing that, which I've called you to do, I'm also going to provide for you, right? God's going to empower you. God's going to equip you. God's going to provide for you, And we see that provision starting in the very first church in, in the book of Acts as we see the church providing resources for missionaries and for pastors and, and family. That's why I have such a heart for missions, that, that we are to provide, that God can use us to provide resources for those who are, who, who are out on the mission field. Now, there's a view, a culture, if you will, that I want us to, to change here at Cross Fellowship. I want us to take the view that Cross Fellowship, as a body, right, Cross Fellowship does not pay for people to pastor. And I'll say that again. I, I, I want us to take the view that Cross Fellowship does not pay for people to pastor, but rather Cross Fellowship provides the resources so pastors can serve freely. It may sound like semantics, but it's not. 
Because I'm called to be a pastor, and I'm going to pastor, and I'm going to obey no matter what. And I'm also called to be a husband and a father, and I'm called to take care of my family. And as, that, as this flock grows, and uh, that, that it's going to take more time and effort, that I can't necessarily be a tent maker, and so I can't get income. I don't have the time to get income on the outside. And, and so the church has called me to be vocational, meaning you all are providing me resources that I can serve freely and still put food on my table. And it's not semantics. It's not semantics. I'm not paid to be a pastor. The church gives me resources so I can pastor freely. And church, I will tell you, every pastor on this staff, every pastor on this staff is a full-time pastor. Every one of them. I fought this for years as a bivocational guy. I would, I would get the question, well, when are you going to go full-time? And I would look over at Trisha and like, that 2 a.m. call last night to go help someone get off the interstate? I didn't say, hey, sorry, I'm not on the clock. Right? Every pastor is a full-time pastor. Now, some are vocational and some are bivocational, but every pastor is a full-time pastor here. And church, I cannot thank you enough for the resources that you give me and the other pastors that we can just serve freely. So thank you. So Jesus says, don't take any of this. This... This missionary journey, this calling, this is going to require faith. I'm going to take care of you. All right. Now we start to close with these last four verses here. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. And as you enter the house, greet it. Now, this word worthy is is not referring to like any sort of moral worth uh, or even or financial worth. but, but rather, this word worthy really means whoever is responsive to the gospel message that, that you're giving, who's ever responsive, that's, that's where you stay. doesn't matter if they're rich or if they're poor. No, no, no. If they're responsive to the gospel message, that's where you go and that's where you stay. And I really appreciate how Luke 9 puts it, where Jesus speaks in Luke 9. He says, hey, don't go from house to house to house to house. Like, don't go ministering looking for a better deal. Right? That's, that's our instruction, that we must minister with integrity without any sort of personal agenda, without any sort of person, you know, hope to get a personal gain, right? We received without pain. We should give without pay. And so, again, that calling, our calling to ministry should be done without an agenda. And so we, uh, so, so, so whoever's worthy, you, you stay in that house. You don't go house to house. And then verse 13, if that house is worthy, again, responsive, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. We should be bringing a message of peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for theirs is the kingdom of God. A peacemaker, right? Jesus made peace with God by taking on the punishment for my sin and for your sins and by putting our faith Uh, In Jesus, we can have peace with God, so we should be preaching a message of peace. It does not say, but if it is not worthy, argue them into the kingdom of heaven. You'll get it. It does not say, beat them down, be contentious. Oh, I know. If that house isn't worthy, go ahead and put a Facebook post up. It doesn't say that. It says that we are to be a people of peace. It's really fascinating. Yesterday, there was a knock on my door from three young men wearing white shirts and a name tag that said Elder So-and-So, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They have not knocked on my door in years. I'm like, I must be preaching on this tomorrow. And so these three young men, incredibly polite, uh, introduced themselves to me and who they were and where they were from. And so uh, in peace... I introduced myself, and I said, hey, uh, I'm Matt Morton, and I'm a Southern Baptist pastor, and I would, I would love to have a conversation with you, but I'm not sure we're going to see eye to eye, but I would love to have a conversation with you if you're, if you're willing, but no, I am not moving my line, and the one gentleman said, yeah, let's, let's chat. I'm like, yes. <laughs> now, that Yes, is not because I view those three young men as my enemy. They're not the enemy. They're three young men who are lost. 
And so we talk about our beliefs. And I explain just why that particular belief that they have is not found in the Bible. And then, you know, we kind of go back and forth, but the whole time I'm being very polite. I'm being very kind, but I'm holding a line because there is a line that we won't cross. I'll talk about that here in a moment. And, and the end of the conversation, the end of the conversation, I said, hey, fellas, I just want you to know I have great concern for your souls. And one of them got a little offended. And I said, but look, you came knocking on my door because you have a concern for my soul. He's like, yeah, I guess we did. And as we were leaving, he, he looked at me and he said, okay, like, one of us is right and one of us is wrong. So this, impor- th- this, co- this conversation matters. And I said, yeah, it matters for eternity. It matters for eternity. Because one of us is going to spend eternity with God and one of us is going to spend eternity without God in a place called hell. And that's exactly the next verse here. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to you, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. That was a symbol to say what you have just rejected is very grave. That you rejecting the gospel of Jesus Christ, Christ crucified, you rejecting that is a very grave situation you've just put yourself in. And why is it going to be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah compared to that land that rejected Jesus? Because Sodom and Gomorrah, they didn't know. They didn't know what they were rejecting yet. Yet if someone hears the name of Jesus and they decline that call, that's severe. And so I have to hold the tension with these young men like, hey, I, I, look, I have concern for your souls and I, and I love you, but I'm going to hold this line. Heaven is real and hell is real. And one of us in this situation, this conversation is right, and one is wrong. And I'm not going to soften my words for you because I, I'm afraid of hurting your feelings. Because that's not having a calling with integrity. Our calling requires integrity. A few months ago, a prominent preacher was on a nightly news talk, radio, talk show, whatever, and he was asked the question, hey, are Mormons Christians? And he goes, mm, yeah, uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, probably. And in an effort not to offend, and I don't know if that was his motivation, but in an effort at least not to offend or hurt, we've made the situation worse. Because whoever heard that and, and is in that, uh, that faith system of Mormonism, guess what? They think they're okay. That's worse. We must minister with integrity. Not ministering for personal gain and certainly not watering down the truth because we're afraid of hurting someone's feelings. We'll speak the truth, we'll speak the truth in love, and we'll bring peace. And that young man took my card, and he said, is this your cell phone number? I said, yes. He said, can we maybe go to coffee? And I'm like, yes, we can. I'll even buy. So be praying for that. But if I would have been obstinate as soon as, hey, look, I'm a Southern Baptist pastor. Get ready, boys. They're gone. They're not going to listen. Your calling requires faith. Your calling requires integrity. We must preach no other gospel than the gospel of Christ. We must preach for no other reason than to glorify Christ. Now, there's one last instruction we can pull out of our text this morning. And we're really going to see it over the next uh, few uh, verses here starting next week. But that, that calling, that our calling can be difficult, that things can get hard, and no matter what, no matter how difficult they get, we must be faithful. We must be faithful. I believe, this, look, you're going to see this all year. This is, our, this, is, this is our focus. This is where we're headed. If, if anyone asks you, hey, what's our, what's our focus? What's our vision around here? Be faithful. Be faithful first to what God has called you to. What has he called you to? to take one step closer to Jesus. And so maybe that's, hey, I I don't read my Bible every day, but now I'm going to read my Bible 
every day. That's one step closer. Or maybe it's, hey, I've never told someone about Jesus, but now I'm going to tell my friend or my coworker about Jesus. That's one step closer. Individually, he has called you to take one step closer to Jesus. What has he called us to corporately? To help others take one step closer to Jesus. We're to be faithful to that which he has called us to. So church, let us be faithful. All right, will you bow your heads? I want to briefly just spend a few moments talking and then we'll pray. I started off this whole message today talking about these, these, these callings. But that very first ring, that outside ring, the call to salvation, maybe you're here this morning and you've never uh, accepted that call, that incoming call. You've declined it, declined it, declined it. But now you realize, no, I, I need to accept this call to salvation. There's something going on inside of me. There's this hole in my heart. I know I need forgiveness of my sins. And I want to accept this call of salvation. In a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing. But if you want to accept this call to salvation, I'm going to ask that you sit and that you pray. To accept this call of salvation, it's very simple. It's very simple. It's an ABC prayer. That first you admit that you're a sinner. You admit that you've fallen short. You just, you missed it. You've made mistakes. You admit that you're a sinner. And B, you believe that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for those sins and then rose again. And then C, in a prayer to God, you admit, you believe, and you confess to God. You confess that you want Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. And you pray and you mean it with all of your heart and you've accepted this call. And then you confess to others, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Now maybe you've accepted that call of salvation, but you're here and you, you have these other calls, call to, call to love the body, serve the body, call to serve the world, and you know there's some places where there are some opportunities, much like I had for so many years, and I just didn't, I just didn't accept that call. There's, there's been these opportunities that you've just been declining, 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 and you know that that's sinful, and you need, to, you need to spend some time with God and just repent from that. And that you need to move into obedience to the calling, to the assignment that he's put on you. So when we stand and pray, if that's you, maybe you need to sit or excuse me, when we stand and sing, maybe you need to sit and pray. In either case, my, my plea with you is, is to obey whatever God is leading you to do right now. If you have questions, if you need prayer, whatever it is, I will be up here. Miss Angela will be up here. We would love uh, just to spend some time with you. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you. Holy Spirit, move. It's your name we pray. Amen.